to go ahead and get rolling. I think we'll probably have a few more members pop in while while I'm talking, but I got to get started on some announcements. Um, hey, Kevin, Jeff, can I get the shared screen? Kevin? Oh, uh, Jack's going to need a little control there to help me go through a PowerPoint of uh, what the announcements are, but I guess I can kick it off pretty easily by welcoming new members and guests. And from what I can see, unless there's some people that I can't see on the screen right now, Forrest, I think you're our guest again. <laughs> good, good to see you and good to have you along here for, for our uh, monthly meeting again. Um, here we go. So welcome everybody to the July 2020 COVID-19 uh, KCWT uh, monthly meeting and demonstration. Um, glad to see everybody join us. And uh, I've got a list of announcements and hopefully we'll get right into the demonstration um, followed by our challenge. And then finally, uh, we'll follow up with our um, show and tell. So. The announcements this month, um, basically, I thought it would be a small list because we haven't been, you know, too active, but uh, the list got kind of large on me. So just bear with me here. I just want everybody to know that Open Shop is continuing in July uh, under the same pretense of uh, 10 people limit. Um, we like to thank all the shop openers that have been been available and have made themselves available to open. And uh, Anthony, thank you a lot for covering a lot of the, the uh, week during the week or weeknight uh, open shop activities. Um, we are still doing the sign up um, through Sign Up Genius. Um, if you have any troubles trying to sign up, if you'd like to go into one of the open shop sessions, let one of the board members know, and I'm sure we can walk you through it or, or help get you signed in. But it is important to kind of keep that list uh, as accurate as possible because it also acts as a backup to who all was in the shop um, for, for a record. Um, however, with the open shop, um, I don't know how it's happening. We've got fewer people in the shop, but the shop seems to be getting messier and, 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 uh, not cleaned up as as well as I as we I think as the board and as the club would like to see. So please uh, take the time to clean up after your turning. Um, we certainly appreciate if you want to clean a little beyond what your space is. But if you're throwing chips halfway across the room, please sweep halfway across the room. Help help keep that shop clean and uh, in good shape. Uh, I do I do appreciate that everybody seems to be following the mask rule. I think we're doing pretty good on the hand sanitizing and, and hand washing um, and probably could do better, but we're, we are trying to wipe down the machines as, as we get through them. So thanks everybody for the cooperation on that. I'm hoping that things will get better as we get on down through the year, but um, in July, since we didn't hit a 10 person max any time in June, I decided just to retain or um, to, to maintain that 10 person limit. If uh, towards the end of the month, I start seeing that we're getting crowded or it starts getting more people showing up, I certainly would be open to the idea of maybe bumping that up a little bit. But for right now, I think for safety's sake, uh, keeping it at 10, it keeps everybody in there kind of geared towards uh, turning specifically and uh, that kind of keeps our social distancing in place because of the spacing of the lathes. So that's been working out pretty good. The groups have been small at open shop. So um, if you have a desire, it's a great time to be able to get about any machine you want. If you want to show up to, and sign up and, and come to one of the open shop meetings. Um, slide two, Jack. Um, a note to everybody that, that may not be aware of it, but Kevin has set up a uh, 
Amazon Smile donation uh, opportunity for the Kansas City Wood Turners. The information, um, if you're not aware of how that works, I'm not completely aware. I don't use Amazon that much, but it sounds like there is it's absolutely no cost to the user. Um, it doesn't increase the cost of the items you are spending or you're buying. It just uh, literally takes a percentage, a small percentage of that purchase and puts it towards the charity of your designation, which in this case we're hoping would be the Kansas City Wood Turners Club. Um, there is information that will be uh, on the newsletter in regards to how, to how to get that started, but if you have any questions, feel free to approach any of the board members and we'll help find out the information if we don't know. Um, we are still planning on, on sponsoring a fr the Freedom Pins event. Mark Inman's going to kind of head that up, but um, I know um, our plans have kind of changed from, from what we were originally intending. We were going to have a big group open shop activity. Um, given the pandemic situation, we're going to change that and just ask that anybody that is interested in, in turning pins for this event, um, they can check out, um, we'll have kits available that'll have the, the pin starts and the pin kits. And we're just asking people to check out some kits and, um, and it will have those available. I think we talked about maybe in August, having those available at the Saturday open shop, you could stop by and pick up kits. And then we're asking them to be turned and turned back into the club um, around September 12th. And then we will we'll compile all of them, um, box them up, and send them to the Freedom Pins coordinators. And then that that organization will get them distributed out to our uh, troops overseas. It's a great way to support a club. It'll make our club look good, but it's also a great way to support our troops and give them uh, something that they can hold on to and 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 maybe. Uh, I think the promotion is to get them to write letters home. Um, so it's a great thing, and I hope we have some good uh, participation. If anybody has any questions on that, I would say um, we can get a hold of Mark, but basically it's going to be a pretty loose thing uh, as, as far as we just need turners that are willing to turn a few pins and, and then turn those pins over to the Freedom Pins event. So. More information will come on that. Um, we do have uh, club member opportunities that, that we would like uh, somebody outside of the board to, to help coordinate or, or help manage. One of those is uh, we're looking for somebody with a little bit of computer savvy. I don't think they have to be um, a, a computer genius, but uh, needs a little bit of computer savvy to manage a club Etsy site that, that we're trying to get up and rolling. Um, if you're interested in that, and please consider it, but if you had any interest in that, um, please let one of the board members know and we'll be in contact with you. Um, it might be a super opportunity to get some um, donation funds coming towards the club and it might even offer opportunities for individuals to kind of um, sell some of their own items there also. Um, also, if anybody has a desire or, or thinks that they, they could be helpful, um, Sean is always looking for somebody to help with the, the Wood Chips monthly newsletter in providing articles and helping format and backing him up when he can't be there. Um, photographs, any, it could be a, a multitude of things that he could use help with. So if there's anybody interested in uh, uh, donating a little time every month to the newsletter, please see Sean. He would appreciate the help, I'm sure. Give me a thumbs up, Sean. Yep. Yep. All right. You got um, it. <laughs> Mark Inman also is um, going to make a pressure pot available to to the club members that you can check out from the club. I think that's a 
great opportunity if some people that are, are interested in that. But I will note that, you know, the safety is kind of on, on the user and we're going to take no responsibility for that. So make sure you know what you're doing. But uh, we'll get some information out on how, how we'll determine how to uh, basically kind of check it out from the, so we know who has it and, and then how long they'll have it from the club. But that's coming. Um, and Sean is working with the wood turners, or excuse me, the woodworkers guild. Um, it, there's some talk about maybe trying to put together a Christmas sale that would be at the, I think right now it'd be planned at the, uh, at our shop. And it would be a, a benefit for both the woodworkers guild and the wood turners. We would kind of have two separate sides of tables and um, basically anything sold on our club would go to our club. Anything sold on their club from their club would go to their club, but it would be an opportunity to, to get some funds in. Um, as you all can imagine with the um, cancellation of several of the activities and things, we don't have income coming in to the club that we are kind of accustomed to. And since we no longer have the tool auction that, that was an annual event several years ago, um, we need some opportunities when we need to take advantage of any opportunity we have to try to get some donations or, or get some sales to go towards the club. So that's some of the ideas that are out there. More information on that to come. Um, Sean will, will fill us in as he gets more information. I think it, it's pretty preliminary right now. Okay, um, going on to the next thing is the silent auction in July is a piece that I created um, called a wood platter or a bowl with a big rim or a um, funny looking hat. But anyway, it's a Jacoba wood platter. I'd certainly appreciate it if I got at least a bid on that. So if you have any interest. <laughs> Uh, I think yeah, the bid will the bidding will be open until Friday. Is that right, Kevin? That's right, Friday. Okay, so uh, please take opportunity, put in a bid, and uh, help out the club. The August silent auction piece will be a piece from Rick Bywater, um, and it will be a Japanese cherry bowl, and I believe it's got some uh, resin included in it. So I'm excited to see the piece and, and see what uh, Rick's got, got available to bid on. So please be looking for that. An email will come out uh, that will have a nice pictures and a, and a good description of what it is and the size and everything. I'll send that out this week. So you'll see Rick's donation this week. It is beautiful, too. Um, Rick can produce some very nice stuff, so I'm sure it will be worth taking a look at. So be looking for that email, um, and and please consider consider making a bid on these. Um, again, it supports our club. It it, it supports the people that are doing the turnings, um, and it's it's fun to have other people from the club have some of those pieces around with your things. So. You can show everybody how much better your things are than theirs. That's, that's what I like. Yeah. <laughs> that was my attempt at a joke, but anyway. Um, in August, um, we are going to have another live stream professional demonstration from Mike Mahoney. And uh, that's Trent Bosch. It is Trent Bosch. That is Trent Bosch. It, okay, wrong picture, right name. Um, Mike, Mike Thomas has, has coordinated efforts with Mike Mahoney, who's not that guy in the picture, that is Trent Bosch, and he's going to be doing a demonstration on uh, Halloween, which uh, we all felt from uh, on the board that that's something that we haven't done a demo on for a while, and then uh, I think along with that, Mike, was it surface decoration? I tell you, that's changed a little bit, Chris. What's going okay. on? I talked to Mike the other day, and he has had a number of clubs request a new demonstration that he's doing. is is just a broad brush overview, and he touches on a little bit of everything. And one of the things he asked me, he goes, let me ask you, do you guys have any oak in your area? I go, oh, yeah, we got a ton of red oak and some white oak. And he said, 
that is gorgeous wood to turn if you know how to cut it and how to handle it. And he goes, I've got some, you know, a list of tips, a short list of tips that can really, really help. He goes, but he's been selling uh, white walnut platter blanks left, I mean, as fast as he can make them. And they are gorgeous. So anyway, that's, the subject is a little bit, but he's going to touch on hollowing. He's also going to talk about uh, making heirlooms or things that last. And I think it's going to be real interesting. So look forward to next month as well. I'm laughing because I'm watching the, the uh, picture of Trip go away. And I think we're going to have pretty soon a tri uh, the right picture of Mike Mahoney. So everybody will have that in their mind. Thank you, Jack. I'm, I'm trying. I don't know if we can get there fast enough. Uh, Mike, Mike Thomas, can you keep talking? Yeah. No, I tell you, I really think this is going to be an outstanding presentation. And, uh, you know, I, if you saw Mike, okay, a little history. If you watch, if you tuned in the symposium, Mike's first um, presentation was uh, 35 years of wood turning. And what happened with that is that's what the AAW asked him to do. And he's, you know, kind of a humble guy. And he doesn't really like to talk about himself a lot, but he tried to, do that and Beth Ireland did the same thing Saturday or Sunday and hers was outstanding of course she's got quite a quite a resume but uh, Mike you know when I talked to him he, go, he's, he was still really nervous and putting that thing together and trying to rehearse it and everything so that's why and he really did appear nervous. <laughs> Is this a better picture? Yes that's him. That's All right. him okay. I think, yeah, I don't know who Mike is, so you could have put anybody's picture. <laughs> I would have believed it, but I did know who Trent Bosch was, so I knew that wasn't right. Um, <laughs> this is this is going to be a we're paying the club will be paying Mike for for our demonstration that night. So we are going to ask that everybody that joins us consider uh, donating ten dollars uh, to the club. Um, Kevin will send out an email that that will explain how how you can do that. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to that. I think these live streams are becoming, uh, well, other than being necessary, they're also becoming more and more uh, improved. And I think people are getting a little bit more comfortable with doing them. So I think they're, uh, it, it gets better all the time uh, from what I've seen. Um, let's see. That takes me. Uh, we're going to be leading in tonight to – this month's demonstration that's going to be uh, Dave Stalling showing us how he created the time catcher piece that was the art piece, um, art auction piece for, I believe, April or May. Um, I believe uh, he wants to start out with Jack, though. Jack helped, assisted Dave in putting together some video stuff for the presentation. And um, uh, I will let Jack lead in, but before Jack starts, I'm going to give our uh, mic over to Epi Camara and ask him to present us with this week's uh, safety minute from Epi. And Kevin, you may have to give him control of his for his. There you oh, go. Well, you let, me, let me do that right now. Now, I watched this little video earlier today. Uh, you're going to see a lot of things that you probably know, but it never hurts to hear it over and over and over again. So it's pretty simple okay. and straightforward. Here it starts. Thank you, Abby. Let's quickly cover some basic safety rules about the lathe so that you can make sure you're safe when you're using the machine. First, RPM. It's very, very important that you have the correct RPM selected for the machine before you put the work on. So you want to refer to a speed chart and make sure that based on both the size and the length of your spindles or bowls, you've got the right speed set up on your machine. Then you want to be certain that your lathe has the work secured. So between centers, I want to make sure that I'm firmly engaged on the spur center and the tailstock center on this end. If I'm using a faceplate, 
Want to make sure that I've got screws that are plenty substantial through the face plate into the bowl to hold everything in place for me. Now let's have a look at the tool rest. It's very, very important. You want to make sure that the tool rest is always as close as it can be to your material without actually touching. Before I turn the lathe on, I'm going to spin that piece to make sure that if it's missing on one corner, it's missing on all four corners. So if I'm just a little bit off center, I don't have a part that's going to bang into the tool rest. So you want to make sure that that's set up just right. Now for you personally, there are a couple things that you need to do. All the jewelry should be off. No rings, watches, or bracelets. We don't want anything that can get caught here. If you've got long sleeves on, they should get rolled up to your elbows. Even better, short sleeves so that you don't have anything dangling over the machine. For personal protection, a couple things you want to do. Whenever you're working on the lathe, you should have a full face shield on. The chips are going to fly here, especially I think more so with bowls than with spindles, but there's always a lot of stuff flying off. Safety glasses are good. Full face shield is better. That way you're fully protected. Now a lot of stuff is going to get airborne, certainly when we're sanding, but even when you're using a chisel. So a dust mask is a great idea so that you don't inhale that stuff. You know, the more <laughs> stuff you breathe in, the more susceptible you become to becoming allergic to it. So you really want to protect yourself right from the start. We can roll these two ideas into one by using a product like this. This gives me a full face shield, plus it's a self-contained air filtration system. There's a battery in here, so when I have this on and I turn it on, it's filtering the air that it's pumping over my face. So this is a great idea for when you're working on the lathe or even just in general when you're working in the shop. So those simple tips are going to help protect you and keep you safe when you're working on the wood lathe. Okay, I, I think, you know, like I say, that's all stuff we've heard before for the most part, but you hear it over and over again and you start practicing it and it's easier to practice. Effie, thank you again for taking the time to, to look up a video that, that applies to our safety minute. And I'm going to pass the meeting over to Jack and Dave stalling, but I would like everybody to know that Jack and Dave have, have been working on this uh, presentation for about the last month in, in getting everything done that needs to be done. And I think uh, we should all be really happy that we have members that are that dedicated to give us that kind of time so that we see a good quality product. Um, Jack, take it over, bud. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Chris. Um, I don't have a presentation. I just thought I'd spend a couple minutes talking about um, what we did. Uh, the setup of the cameras uh, was the same that I used for my demonstration. So um, there's nothing new with um, explaining that. Um, I had set up, um, I had tried using Wi-Fi cameras um, and you know, I'm, I'm assuming my Wi-Fi here uh, is not close enough to the shop. That was not working well. Um, so I went to USB attached cameras, which meant I had to make a platform for my PC. Um, and actually, you'll see in some of Dave's stuff where um, I actually was able to move the lid of the PC so that the um, PC camera had a, a third view to uh, what Dave was, was doing. Um, otherwise, I had two USB cameras set up, um, an overhead camera and kind of a side angle camera. Um, didn't do too much to zoom them in or out. Um, during the symposium this weekend, um, I actually saw uh, one of the presentations um, by the lady, I can't think of her name now and I don't want to pronounce it wrong, um, but she used a software product called vMix, which I'm going to take a look at. Um, and she had some really cool things like, instead of the front view of her um, showing like a squared picture in a picture, it just showed the outline of her body and the lathe and, and the background was, was all transparent. And I thought that was pretty cool. So it allowed um, two or three different camera views, one large one, and then picture in a picture on a couple other views. Um, that, that really helped, I think, to um, improve the, the um, experience for the user. Hey, um, Cindy Drozda. Cindy Drozda. Cindy Drozda. Yes, that's correct. And her presentation okay. last night at 6.30, she walked us through that whole thing and she has a green screen behind her. 
And she said, if anyone has any questions, please give her a call. So, so yeah, call okay. her and she'll be happy to tell you all about it. It's yeah. Cool. Yeah. I, you know, it's got like five levels of the software you can get. And um, to, if, if it, if it costs, at the high end to do what she was doing, then I'll, I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> but that's, it. That's what she was saying. It, she gets by on the cheap. Yeah. Well, and so that'll be nice. So I was going to download that and take a look at that. And I'll, I'll give uh, everybody some feedback on it. Um, I know vMix is both um, Windows and um, Apple product. Uh, used last time and, and for David's thing, we, I used a um, software I got out of the uh, Windows web store um, called IP Camera Viewer. It's primarily meant to view um, internet cameras. So you can go like to your favorite national park and show, you know, um, Denali or go to a zoo and, and put that as part of the picture. Um, it also has an option to go to just using USB cameras. So that's what I used um, in the shop uh, for myself and as well as for uh, David's recordings that we did um, in the shop here. So um, that, that's about it. Any questions? Uh, Jack, you notice uh, Cindy Grosad recommended uh, lucidwoodturners.com. I guess they've got all kinds of information on there on this VMAX or V or whatever it is. And that's other stuff connected with the videos and audio. Okay. I think Good to know. VMAX Thank was you. what Larry Randolph was using, if I'm not mistaken, to, to run his cameras. She had that right on her headstock. Just a little, it's a keyboard. She had, yeah, she had a little uh, controller on, on her. Um, the ways of the lathe, and so she was able to zoom in and zoom out on cameras uh, very quickly. Um, I'm sure it takes a little practice to get skilled at doing that, but I mean, she didn't have a camera person doing anything. She did it all herself. So it's impressive. Pretty slick. Okay, David, I think it's your time. Why don't you take over here? Okay, somebody give me a share screen so I can share mine. I got it. Now the question is, give me a minute. Uh, we gotta try again. There'll be a brief intermission for anyone needing popcorn. That's available in the lobby. <laughs> All right, hopefully you see turning a time catcher. How, what's everybody got? Yep. Yep, right. got, it. got it. Well, uh, thank you for this opportunity. I think I have to put that in positive words. And I want to thank Jack for his support because without him, there might not be a time catcher or there might not be video. So uh, I put together uh, this proposal for, I mean, this description for how to make a semi-spherical object with a base that is turned on the inside and on the outside at almost right angles. And this is something I have made several of, so I just want you to know that with a little practice, you can make more than one. And that's always a good test. So in this case, I chose to make it from walnut, and I have uh, sent to uh, our, our treasures that uh, to put on a website this information on how to make a time catcher, what you need to do. So the first four or five slides are available on our website. And uh, to obviously, to, to make this object, we need to do essentially three different kinds of things. The first is to get something to work with. In my case, it was uh, four or six. Uh, walnut that was very dry that always helps if you don't have to worry about things moving around on something like this and then uh, the object is to turn this off center and uh, center on one end and about five eighths on the other and uh, to make that work right you need to cut the bottom of the uh, woods about five degrees 
and you'll see it mounted on the lathe here in a couple of slides. And uh, so what we were going to do is to essentially create the form of the outside and get it in, ready to mount in a perpendicular way to take the inside out of it. So we'll just move on down through these slides. And the, one of the key things is figure out how do you hold something round when you've been turning it on centers the, uh, on the other axis. And so I chose to make uh, a uh, mount, uh, so think of a donut, and to use hot glue for this particular one. Now the first ones I made, I did with a five inch uh, vacuum chuck, but because I was going to do this over jacks, I thought we better not try doing a vacuum chuck because that's a little tricky. I have had objects leave the bowl of a vacuum chuck. And with this, that's not something you want to have happen. So after you've got it uh, roughed out, you then have to uh, mark your center and figure out how you're going to put the spacings. So you'll see this. And I chose to use about 3 16 inch screw with a wall thickness of uh, about 5 16 or a quarter would have been ideal, but you have to worry about whether the center of the inner sphere is the same in the same place as the center for the outer sphere. And because that will create real serious offset issues for you. So um, after you've got the uh, outside turned properly, then put it on the donut, glue it in place, and you need a couple of tools to put, turn your grooves. Uh, a diamond-shaped cutoff tool is particularly useful to do this, not a regular cutoff saw, but one that's wide in the center and uh, so that you've got clearance to move the tool a little bit. And uh, so we'll see this then. Uh, it did, I have listed the tools. You're free to use anything you think will work. And uh, so with that, we sort of say, let's make something happen. First on the left, you'll see a piece of uh, four by six walnut that I cut off five center. You'll notice it's tilted with respect to the bandsaw blade. And then the right hand side shows mounting that on the lathe on centers, but the uh, square end is offset five eighths of an inch from the edge and you could get by with a little uh, closer edge if you want to tilt it even more and the reason it's tilted you like to have your spur safety spur on the other end running square with the wood so you don't have to worry quite so much about getting things lined up so i always like to see if you can actually project onto what you're making the center line uh, form, if you will, if of a drawing, it'd be a hidden line uh, view. And the one on the left shows the face profile with the face tilted back from the bottom. And that is just to give you an idea of how much wood I got to get rid of. And on the right is mounted, is the center line view for the sphere. And the sphere center needs to be in the same place as the outside and that you've got about a millimeter offset potentially due to inclining the plane on the face when you draw it on. So an, a millimeter is 40 thousandths of an inch and if you can get your centers that close you're probably going to be okay. But if they're two, two millimeter you're going to have trouble with the intersections. So any questions on you know the layout piece Notice there's some cracks in this wood, but I looked at the piece carefully and uh, those cracks are gonna get turned away. So I didn't worry about, you know, having a perfect piece of wood. I don't think a perfect piece of wood exists. So uh, we're ready to start. And you can see there, we actually turned a little bit there. And um, there that shows you the face view. Um, I mean, at the side, I would say side and face, and then uh, at the emerging shape of the sphere on the right is starting to turn. Now, it's kind of important that you, when you lay your sphere out, that the dimensions can actually be made on the piece of wood you have. So a sphere of five inches is gonna be two and a half inch radius. So there is, it is possible to, to, have, to, to make the piece with the width of wood you have. So, you know, do a little bit of math on what your dimensions are going to be. And on the left, you see the emerging of the emergence of the base. 
and on the right is a really big fat sit spin uh, top knot. And so uh, we're moving right along here with, uh, I got to keep my slides together. So having turned away a copious amount of wood, we now are approaching having the first phase of this uh, done. And on the left, you'll see I holding a semi a half circle uh, template over the side of the sphere. I've got the base about the right size for what I wanted to have. It is obviously bigger than it will be when we're finished. And then you'll notice on the right that they're in the lower portion of the sphere toward the center. You'll see there's a little offset where the uh, uh, looks like a, uh, a vase holding up the sphere. Well, that'll get turned away. And the other thing is I wanted to make sure that I had a sphere, spherical shape. And so the, I brought in some months back the sphere cutter that I made using a lever arrangement. And so I checked my work on whether it was, and we were about an eighth of an inch off. So, you know, you, you may think you got a sphere on the left and you'll find out, nah, probably not. So that uh, you can pretty much do your normal turning once you know that it's round, because you can gauge taking off like an eighth of an inch all the way around. And the reason that that uh, offset on the bottom there is I can't swing my center of sphere further than that because it hits the center tool rest. And otherwise you can tell, see the little X in the center? Uh, we're not quite as small as we need to be because when we get to the thickness of the wood, that's, that flat spot is gone. We've essentially reached the end of our phase of turning. So let's assume we get to where we want to be. As these pictures show, you clean it up, sand it a little bit, and you can see uh, what you're working with. Now, one thing is in big black letters here, measure the distance from the face of the sphere shown on the left to the bottom of the sphere on the right and write it down someplace and don't rely on your memory because you say, why do you want to do that? Well, we're going to turn the middle of this sphere away. And if you go too far, you're going to have a useless funnel or you're going to be in real trouble. So you've got to be able to measure what the wall thickness is. And if you know how thick it was to begin with, you can do the math. So basically, uh, we're ready to turn. You'll notice on the right, the little top knot has been trimmed down and it's essentially the shape it needs to be. And so much for turning on centers, you say, well, maybe not. You'll see a, how, how you can use a, a half inch or three eighths inch socket by sliding it over your top knot, and still put a, 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 a turn that on centers. So how do we get the sphere mounted on the chuck? And this has been used several times. It's just a piece of oak that was wet when I made it and it's cracked and it's, uh, it's either works with a five inch uh, chuck or a three inch um, uh, tenon on it. And this is what the, the right view is what the chuck is gonna uh, grab onto and the left view is what's gonna get glued to the, uh, um, to the uh, donut. So on the right, we've got a hot air gun. That's your friend. I found that hot air glue guns are nice, but they're pretty much useless when it comes to gluing something on your lathe. At least that's been my experience. Now it's all right to finish up and making sure you got it all right. The, the donut's been chucked and we're heating up the uh, surface of the uh, uh, donut on the face and we're putting on the hot air glue all the way around. And we're going to keep it pretty warm because in the next step, let me see how far I can advance this. So that's all we've got here. We're just getting the glue hot. And in the next one, let's do something with it. If I can find my mouse. So we have that center mark. Remember I showed you it was in the picture in the front of the slides when we started. So we've got the center point of the live center on the face and we're using our eyeball to see if we can't get the face of that sphere perpendicular to the lathe bed and we're heating things up and Jack 
came to the rescue there with a little bit of fill in the gaps from the hot air gun. And of course you can press the sphere into the hot glue with the center, with the tailstock. And when you're satisfied that you've done a good enough job, and I'll leave that up to you entirely to gauge whether you got it glued on or not. Uh, don't worry about taking it off. That's the least of your problems. Because if you get to where you need to, you'll be further down the road. And uh, so, the, as I mentioned before, you got to align with the internal and the external spheres. And this is where I said be as certain as you can that you've got the uh, sphere centered and that you've got your tailstock centered uh, as well. So in the next step here, we've got to start taking away some wood. And obviously we like to end up with a 5 16 inch wall. And um, let's see, hold on just a minute. And in the way Jack had this set up, he had his cameras there and he took this with a steel camera, but um, I used a, uh, a Fosner bit to start this process with, and we're working on that here, get our movie. All right, and here's just showing the Fosner bit, nothing real original there, except I didn't have the lathe turning, I had the drill, the drill turning it. I got a little Dewalt half, uh, half inch uh, battery uh, powered drill. And in the inset up here, you'll notice that I had the drill resting on the center stock and I'm using the center stock to advance the Fosner bit into the wood and Jack had the chuck locked on this so that we don't have to worry about anything getting out of hand or losing anything so uh, this illustrates you can why you know why turn everything when you can cut away some of it that's my philosophy and uh, and moving on down the road you know we've got it as deep as we want to have it and that's very nice because you can very slowly advance the drill into the wood. And to me, I like control of things. So let's see. Now then we start turning the inside of the sphere away and I used a lathe turner and I think I've advanced one too far. Uh, just talking a little bit about the tools. I used a uh, bowl gouge to turn a good bit of this. And in addition, we, I also used a um, carbide, a 5 8 inch carbide uh, cutter on a, about a two foot steel rod. One of my first tools I bought a long time ago. And I like using the carbide when you get something that's inside and you're trying to work on how deep is it and how, what it, how the shape is. There's a point at which you're, depending on the grind of your gouge, you know, you got the same problem as making the bottom of a bowl. You can get a catch and you catch it, it's something you do not want to have happen to you. And so after making uh, some measurements here, uh, just showing we, how close are we to the wall thickness we want. And I think I said to Jack, I think we're there. And uh, so I used my little uh, Milwaukee sander polisher with a three inch disc and those scallop edges and just turned this by hand uh, and to get it sanded. And again, are we there in the bottom is what you really need to know. And Dave Stalling didn't write the number down. So we had a little estimation going on as to how far we had gotten and whether we really had the thin the thickness we wanted in the bottom. But uh, Jack saved a day with a measurement from the back to the hollow of his uh, uh, lathe bore, uh, through the lathe uh, head talk, so we could figure out where the end of it was and kind of a make around. But like I said, write that number down so you've got it um, available. And uh, now then we're starting to just sand this up a little bit, get the face trued up uh, and feeling around. Uh, always like to you know reach in and feel how it looks. And don't worry about little things like surface cracks or whatever, because you're going to do some more work on the exterior uh, of this when you get back to turning it on centers. So we're moving. Hey, now, hey David, does, does slide 19 have a video on it? Uh, uh, let's see. I'll have to see. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's where I couldn't. Thank you, Jack. Jack knows what's in here. So it's again turning away 
some of the wood and uh, Jack came to the rescue. He had a nice scraper that also worked out quite well here when we were taking the inner, inner part out of here. So you got to also note that on the left view, things are flying around and you basically have to be very cognizant that you and the object don't come together. At least uh, uh, the other thing that I might mention, Jack didn't have a very good uh, partner when it comes to production staging because my head was in the way a good bit of the time. And, you know, I wasn't concentrating on making a video. I was trying to make this thing work. And uh, so that uh, gives you a little bit more uh, view of what we're doing. Again, kind of like a propeller when it was turning? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's noticeable. You can feel the air, and if you can feel the, the wood, you're too close. <laughs> okay, so we're still just trying to get it. You'll notice there the face of it's beginning to shape up a little bit. And so now we're back to what I mentioned earlier. Uh, we have the job to put grooves in this thing. So here... Uh, here we have a video of doing that. And so I always choose to leave the little button in the center simply because you got to start somewhere and having a hole in the center really doesn't do much for me. You know, I'd rather have about an eighth of it to a quarter inch plug to start. So you'll see that's what's been marked there on the right. And just a matter of, you know, holding your pencil and using your eye and proportioning the right spacing here and this isn't set in stone until you put the, the uh, diamond shaped cutoff tool in place and start cutting. So if your marks don't look right, you've got the chance to correct it or maybe not correct it. And so the object is to keep your spacings, you know, coming along uh, to the, complete the whole around. Now, another problem that presents itself here, you'd like to have your cutting tool go into the piece of wood as though it's going through the center of the sphere so that your perpendicular, if you will, are tangent to the uh, wood that you're cutting away. Well, that's possible about two thirds of the way, but when you get back toward the top third of the inner surface, it's not possible to do that with a diamond shaped cutoff tool. So to that end, I have a picture here uh, is we've got the sphere mark now, so we're going to cut some cut some grooves, and uh, see if this one will start. I think this is the one. Maybe it's the next one. Bear with me here, just a minute. Now here we've cut the first three grooves. We're using that diamond shaped, uh, and I'm sorry I'm in your view, but we're using that diamond shaped uh, parting tool. And it's quite, quite a useful tool for almost anything for cutting off because it, the widest part of the tool is exactly in the center of the tool. So there's always good clearance for chips and you rarely get it jammed up. So a uh, problem here, you have to make some measurements of how deep have I cut and uh, you know, am I getting a reasonably good spacing? All those things are are important to get the right outcome. Where are we here? All right, one more. Continuing the process, you'll see here we've reached the point at which it's about the end of using the cutting diamond cutoff tool. And this is a piece, a 3 16th piece of tool steel that I got off of eBay. And I bent it in a vise and also ground it to be the equivalent of a cutting tool. It's shaped again a little bit like the diamond tool. It's wider at the face than it is in the back. What you may not see is that a holding aid is a vise grips. I found that uh, nice to have a handle on it, but you can't really hold on to it when you're really trying to cut you know, on an obscure angle. So I used a vise grip to hold the tool and have it in the center rest. It really doesn't take a lot of force, but the problem is you have to hold it steady when you start cutting and you don't want to move things, have the tool move on you. And it definitely are opportunities for catches here. You know, catches are not your friend. So the object is to keep advancing that tool around and you can go in and true up anything, you know, and the object is to get these 
at least three sixteenths of an inch deep and maybe a slightly deeper because you're going to turn the outer ones to intersect with those. And the better job you do of having the inner sphere coincide with the external sphere, the more likely are you're going to get clean cut throughs. And so I think that one is done. And uh, now it's time to disassemble, disassemble this process. So here we just are trying to illustrate uh, taking it apart and the, using the uh, hot air gun to warm things up. And definitely you have the opportunity to send your fingers, your hair and your fingers and or overheat the bowl. So don't get too excited with trying to get this done in less than a minute or two. David, and, how do you, how do you um, make sure that the depth is e even in all, all those grooves? Yeah. Yep, you have to be sure they're deep enough and that they're essentially uh, clean. And I'll let you see, it does come off, I think, in this video. There it goes. I think you had a caliper you were using to measure yeah. the depth. Depth gauge, just a little fine point on the end of a, a, a precision caliper. And I was trying to get them two tenths of an inch, which is a little over the 316th mark. Good question. Now then, we're back to on centers. And you'll notice a little differences in events here. But anyway, we've got to turn down this. In one of the pictures, I had gotten the later one earlier. But nevertheless, we've got to shape things up here. So our, we had a tenant on the base. And we have a job to do is to turn this down uh, on the top. And we want to mark the root grooves on the outer side. So back to having things lined up on centers, no funny stuff going on with mounting it. And here again is what we did for the inside, we got to do for the outside. And uh, I think next page for video. I'm sorry. I think it's in the next one, maybe. It should be here. Maybe not. Well, maybe it doesn't want to load, but anyway, we had a video showing cutting the outer grooves. I'm sorry, it doesn't seem to be in place. Um, maybe I'm just not quite far enough. When in doubt, press next slide. So here we've sanded uh, and getting the surface cleaned up because there is a little bit of hot glue residue that's left on it. And uh, again, here we want to get the uh, marking on the outside done. Same kind of object on spacing. Um, and you've marked it, mark all the lines so you know what your centers are. Same rule applied. You'd like to have your, the tip of your grooving tool be pointed through the center of the inner uh, center of the sphere. Um, and that way you'll get your surface perpendicular. It'll be a nice cut. When David, you... how, how do you get rid of the hot glue marking? Uh, that, it sands off. Okay. Or you can uh, take alcohol if you really have a problem and wipe it off. But I, it, it wasn't really very hard to get. You can actually take your, when it's hot, and as it starts to crystallize, you can take your finger and ball it up like, I want to say rubber cement. That's worked too. So we've we've got our object marked, and uh, the next job is to do something with the wood that we don't want, and it's called get rid of the make the grooves. Hmm. If it did play, there we go. Yeah. We got the lathe running. You'll notice the neck is uh, cleaned up on the support. And uh, so we're just using a diamond cutting point to pierce the uh, cutting. We'll let this run a little bit. One thing I also should note or tell you that it's very, very important that that uh, diamond cutting tool be sharp. 
you've you got to sharpen that uh, regularly. I wouldn't cut more than three or four grooves uh, with it. And if you hear a clacking sound, you know, while you're doing this, take precaution and go sharpen your cutting tool because what that's telling you is a tool is entering the space that doesn't have wood in it rather than cutting. And that can lead to some interesting consequences. So now here the object is to also try to get this depth sufficient to intersect with the uh, previous interior sides. And you may have to go back and do a little bit of cleanup to you know actually get them deep enough. If you don't get them deep enough, guess what? You get to open them up or not have an intersection. Pretty straightforward. And these have not quite reached this, the uh, this thinness. I'm going to step ahead a little bit here just to get this. David, I noticed you started with the center line. Does it matter where you start these outer? I don't think it would matter. It's probably better to work from the tailstock toward the headstock. I don't, but I always like to say, where am I going to start? That way, I space the the spacing gets spread to the to the top and the bottom. Okay. It, I think it's just my preference. Uh, no matter what you need to sharpen that tool. So. Stopping and stop and check, you know, is always a good thing. You notice on occasion there's a little tearing, but you're gonna to get to sand this away quite a ways anyway. So you can pretty much clean up the top. I didn't take any special care you know, after I had it smooth enough to basically turn. And then knowing where to stop is a matter of preference on, you know, you'd like to have one groove past the uh, surface so that you actually have a groove around the top knot. Is there a weak uh, spot in, in this process? It's pretty sturdy. I won't say, well, I'm not going to make a comment on it. Uh, yeah, it's obvious there's, you have been weakening this from the get go. As soon as you put center grooves in the middle of it, you're, you know, you have less strength than you had. But amazing, uh, if the wood is pretty good in terms of its integrity, uh, you know, it's amazing how, how, uh, how much inner, in, in inner integrity that the piece has, even after you've been chewing on it. And here we're, you know, cutting in, into it. Keep moving along here. Hey Dave, did you detect any flexibility in your cuts as you were making them? Nope. In that wood? Not if you keep that tool sharp. Okay. You'll notice they're deep, pretty deep on the right-hand side. Uh, you know, we're down now well into the 3 16th inch depth. And the other thing you've got to be careful, if you don't have a sharp tool, you begin to cut into that edge deeper than the rest of the wood. And that's, that is something you can tell when you look at it. And of course, if you sand a little bit of that away, you'll get it sort of back to the thickness you want. But uh, I'm not saying sanding is the cure to all things. But here you see, we're pretty much uh, approaching the grooves and, and it's I don't remember using the 316th tool, and I'm checking just to make sure that we've got uh, the tail pressure, tailstock pressure is something you may have to release a little bit because this is a bit compressible now. So, you know, just check to make sure that it's your center piece is, is still supporting things as you'd like. And come on. And it's kind of got the have feed out of sink here. We're about to the end of it. So that's uh, essentially the, the time piece has been um, 
essentially created at this point. We just have the job of finishing it up. And that's always fun and games when you get it to that point. And then you also have to part this off, you know, so you got to clean up the top, a little cleanup work. Um, and that's the results of this particular piece. It's been parted off. The top knot is cleaned up. And um, let's see, then the next step was to oil it. And there were some places I had to piece, I mean, to cut the intersections out, particularly on near the top, where that uh, those pieces were not as easy to cut, I guess, when I made the grooves. And so there ended up taking maybe a 30 second of wood, you know, to get the hole to show up. And I found a, a Dremel tool works pretty well to help with that. If you can find one of those carbide cutting tips that are essentially a, a sh really sharp cone with uh, half of the cone cut off on the carbide. And I have no idea what they call them other than that they're a tremendously sharp uh, tool that you can just do little piercings with. So some of you carvers probably know what they are. And uh, let's see. So as Paul Harvey would say, there's the rest of the story. And this is, I think in the spirit of full disclosure, I'll play this uh, thing. And I don't feel so bad in showing this to you because if it can happen at a national meeting, it can happen on my land. Oh, gee. <laughs> I'm glad the video wasn't too uh, well, that the audio wasn't captured too well. I'm not sure that there weren't at least one full letter word expanded. But there's always, you know, when uh, nature gives you a lemon, you want to go make lemonade. So guess what? Picked up all the pieces. This time I brought them home. With super glue, this thing went back together and it had the only void in the entire structure was about a one eighth inch wide piece at the base, which was readily filled with uh, super glue and walnut. So the uh, rest of the story is all is not necessarily lost, just have faith and uh, be damn lucky. So I think I'm open to questions. And, you know, like I said, I've made five of these all together and I've lost a half and one other one. And I lost the first one I tried, so don't feel like it's uh, it's not a bit of a challenge. But uh, I thought, you know, as far as next month's uh, challenge, anybody that wants to take it in can leave out any one of these things. Turn out, turn something that has two axis offset turning. That is, you want to have a tilted face and don't make a sphere and cut off half of it. That's my favorite. <laughs> so, uh, so you have a circular base supporting a tilted form. And then as far as making a hole in the middle of it, I don't care. You can, you know, thin wall, hemispherical shape, or make a bowl with grooves and have it on a stand. So just use something that causes you to mount it twice, once online, uh, on axis, and turn it, you know, with the uh, face perpendicular to the, a lathe bed. But true enough, giving you a lot of latitude. Make something you like. And uh, how do we do on time? I haven't been... Uh, you are uh, excellent on time, David. I can't believe you got through it as quickly as you did. Well, thank you, Jack, for your help, because without it, you'd been here at nine o'clock. Well, yeah, I, when you when you mentioned trying to, to demonstrate the uh, time catcher, I'm going... How is that going to be accomplished in a half hour to an hour? I can't believe it. You guys pulled it off. You did a great job. And um, the beauty of, of your demonstration is that it'll be posted onto the website and everybody can go back oh. and view it as they want. They All can right. watch that thing blow up over and over if they want to. <laughs> I, have, I, have, I, have, I haven't sent Jack the whole thing yet, but I'm certainly willing to make it available. It's a huge, it takes one terabyte to get all this together, so. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, no problem. Kevin could put that on his it. computer a hundred times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to talk about this a little bit. I had a warning that I just totally disregarded because I was trying to get through 
get this made and get the video done and everything. So it's right about at this point, I mentioned hearing a click and I don't think we have the audio that captures that, but I heard it. I listen very carefully when I'm turning stuff. And what that is that I had not sharpened this uh, diamond shaped uh, cut off tool one time when I did this. I knew better, I know better. I should have had it sharpened about four times. But as I was pushing to cut these last pieces, I kept, I heard for three, maybe three, a click, you know, click. You hear that when your tool reaches the flat surface of the open space. And what it's telling you is um, your tool has invaded the, the, the empty space. Does that make sense? Yeah, the void. You'll hear a different sound when you have a sharp tool cutting a groove than you have a dull because you have to push on the tool to get it to cut if it's not super sharp. And I was warned, you know, but like all things, you don't heed all the warnings. Like sometimes maybe you forget to wear a face mask, but you get bad things happen when you don't heed the warnings. <laughs> I thought I enjoyed the fact that Jack. Um, well, right. it, it also it also proves to all of us that that you're human and you actually have the same things happen to you that happens to us. So that's always nice to see. Yeah. So, well, if Cindy Droza can do it, David can do it. <laughs> <laughs> we feel really good when I was watching yesterday. I said, "Damn, I know how she feels." <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I. I certainly, I, um, from the club, I, we appreciate your time and the uh, time that you spent to put, put this together so that it was presented in a timely fashion. Um, great job, both of you. Great job. Thank you very much. As far as the time to actually make one of these, we spent, what, Jack, about three... I was going to say, you know, David, the last video ended at one o'clock. What, what was the starting time on the first video? Uh, first go, video. go back up to page yeah. you know, uh, or something. But it was, it was uh, two I and a half, three hours. Right? And then I had turned the phase one of this before the morning before. So I spent laying it out and trying to take those pictures to there. I probably spent four hours. I don't think you could make it in less than a day when it really comes down to it, because there's all this picking that you got to do if you don't do it right. Yeah, I've, I've done that on some of the lattice work. And I remember when I was doing the lattice, like top boxes and stuff like that, that there, I would use that sound. I, you, you hear a difference once it breaks through to the point where it's, it's you know, cut, cutting some air. You, you do hear a difference, even if if you've got a sharp tool, there's so keeping your ears open while you're doing this is a very uh, useful tool as you're doing it to to kind of define when you hit that point of well, uh, um, pushing through. So once again, thanks again. Uh, great, great production. Uh, fun, fun project. I don't know. I've got to. I think I've uh, got to get some. Um, courage before I start something like that but I, 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 I when I saw it the first time I, I wanted to see how you did it because I did not understand the process and now it's brought a little bit more into light I'd probably have to watch the videos and, and go through it a few more times um, but thank you thank you David and thank you Jeff. I'm gonna have to start tonight <laughs> be done by Christmas yeah <laughs> The advice I have is get two pieces of wood and start them. That way you've got to, you've got to fall back after you've had your practice. Yeah. Yeah. Doing things two at a time isn't a bad idea when you're doing turnings anyway. So just skip nice. the last five seconds, Chris, and you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, I don't really have any more announcements other than I did want to mention that we did pull off a um, a annual Turner's picnic this year again, and we had about probably 15 people there. Hot day, but on, under the shelter, it was nice and cool, and we enjoyed some food and 
for uh, the first chance in a long time. We uh, actually got to um, have some discussions and, and actually converse with everybody uh, again. And that was that was awful nice. It was good to see the people that were there. Um, and it was it's always a, a fun time to, to get together with everybody. So thanks, everybody, for uh, that participated and, and helped.